Welcome to an introduction to accounting, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This is the second podcast in our series on ratios, and we will look at ratios that are concerned with measurements of liquidity and efficiency. Let us start with a recap. In the first podcast, we looked at those ratios concerned with profitability. This podcast looks at ratios concerned with assessing the ability of an entity to pay current liabilities as they become due, the liquidity ratios. And we look at those that assess the management of resources, the efficiency ratios. In our final podcast, we shall look at gearing ratios and investor ratios. As before, the information that we require can be obtained from the financial statements. These include the income statement, which is shown here, and the balance sheet, which is shown here. Do not forget there may be other information that you require, which may be in notes to the accounts or in records of historical share prices. The ratio for liquidity that we are interested in is called the current ratio. It is obtained by dividing the figure for current assets by the figure for current liabilities. Where can we find these figures? The figures can be obtained from the balance sheet. Current assets are shown as £220 million and current liabilities are shown as £95 million. Let us substitute into the ratio. 220 divided by 95 gives a result of 2.3 to 1. Note that we are not using a percentage here, but expressing it as a typical ratio. What information is this ratio provided? For every £1 of current liabilities, there are £2.3 of current assets available. This is a measurement of an entity's ability to meet its current liabilities. For manufacturers and retailers, a figure of between 1.5 to 2 is considered to be healthy. If the figure is below this, then the next statement to examine would be the cash flows from operating activities. See the podcast on cash flows if you need to revise this point. The current ratio is considered important when structuring debt agreements. The acid test for liquidity is to take the result of current assets less inventory and to divide this by the current liabilities. Let us look up these figures. These figures are found on the balance sheet. Current assets are £220 million, inventory at cost is £115 million and current liabilities are £95 million. We can now calculate the ratio. We have 220 million less 115 million. Now divide by 95 million. And we have a ratio of 1.1 to 1. Once again, note this has not been expressed as a percentage. This differs from the current ratio because inventory has been excluded. Only the most liquid assets are included in this calculation. The expected result is around 1 to 1, but it may vary a little from one industry to another. You should note that if the answer were to be less than 1 to 1, for example 0.5 to 1, then this shows that there are insufficient liquid assets to cover current liabilities. Now we turn to some measures of efficiency. The ones we shall consider are expressed in terms of days. The average inventories turnover period is determined as the average of inventories held divided by the cost of sales and then multiplied by 365 days. Where can we find the figures for this? The figures for inventory are on the balance sheet. The calculation requires an average, which means that we need the figures for inventory at the start and the end of the year. These have been highlighted for you. At the start, inventory was 82 million, and at the end of the year, it was 115 million. The cost of sales figure comes from the income statement. 
and is £432 million. Now let us carry out the calculation. For average inventories, 115 plus 82 divided by 2, then divided by 432, and finally multiplied by 365, we get an answer of 85.2 days. On average, any item of inventory will be held for just over 85 days. Generally, the faster an item moves, the better this is. But it can also lead to inventory shortages. At the end of the year, there should still be inventory to sell. If this were not so, then there would be a dead period whilst the company waited for new inventory before trading again. The average settlement period for trade receivables tells us how long it is before a customer pays for the goods purchased. It is measured by taking the average trade receivables and dividing by the credit sales, then multiplying the result by 365 days. We find the figures we need for trade receivables on the balance sheet. For the year 2010 the figure is 61 million and for 2011 the figure is 89 million. The figure for the credit sales will be the sales revenue, 720 million pounds. This we find on the income statement. The calculation then becomes 61 plus 89 divided by 2. So, 75 divided by 720 and then multiplied by 365 and we have an answer of 38 days. The average time it takes to collect monies from trade debtors is important because that figure is idle capital. Decreasing the figure gives more money available for investment. Managers will want to compare this figure against other companies, particularly the figures for competitors. A similar measurement is the average settlement period for trade payables. This is calculated by dividing the average for trade payables by the total of credit purchases, then multiplying the answer by 365. Let us find the figures we need. The figures for trade payables are on the balance sheet. For 2010 the figure was £30 million pounds, and for 2011 the figure was £45 million. Pounds. The figure for credit purchases is the cost of sales from the income statement. The figure we need is £432 million. Pounds. But we also need to consider the change in inventory over the year. The change in inventory means we need the figure at the start, £82 million, and at the end £115 million. So our purchases will be 432 plus 115 minus 82 which is 465 million pounds. Now we can complete the calculation. 30 plus 45 then divide by 2 now divide by 465 finally multiply by 365 we have an answer of 29.4 days. Getting this figure right is a juggling act. If payments are made too fast, then a cash shortage can be created. Whilst if payments are made too slowly, there is a risk of losing suppliers. The final figure in this section is the working capital cycle. This is determined by adding the turnover period and the settlement period for receivables then subtracting the settlement period for payables. In this example, the result is 91.8 days. You might consider this. From taking delivery of the inventory to disposing of it and adding the amount of time we wait for payment shows the number of days between an item bought, sold and payment received. Capital is tied up during this period. We can subtract from this the time we wait to pay a supplier. Since this reduces the time, the capital is tied up and unavailable for any other use. This ends our second podcast on ratios, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. 
We wish you success in your studies. For more information on Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.